One man, one mission. To rid the world of chronic anxiety once and for all. The Anxiety Guy, Dennis Simsek, shares his personal transformation from living a life filled with overwhelming worry to becoming a full-fledged positivity machine. A leading authority in generalized anxiety, Dennis gets to the truth of your mental health challenges and sets you on a path to transforming each and every area of your life. Here he is, the one and only, The Anxiety Guy. Warriors, episode number 177 of the Anxiety Guy podcast is an interview between me and Brad Robinson. Now, he interviewed me for about an hour, so this podcast episode is quite long, and I urge you to listen to it fully until the end, and it's based off of the questions that I've been getting on emotional reframing, past childhood experiences that have caused anxiety, NLP, CBT, a whole bunch of value packed into one interview. So please enjoy and remember, you are more than anxiety. Let's go. He is Dennis Simsek, also known as the Anxiety Guy. He is a certified NACBT coach. He is a certified NLP master practitioner. He is host of the critically acclaimed The Anxiety Guy podcast on iTunes, the number one self-help podcast for anxiety, just in general. Thank you, my friend. It's an honor to be here, and uh, let's change some lives. What do you say? Awesome, man. Awesome. So for those who don't know you, you used to be a professional tennis player for a very long time. You kind of grew up in, in that. And what made you go from being a tennis player to becoming a well-known coach for those who are suffering from anxiety? Um, You know, I'll tell you something, Brad. It was was never a goal for me to be a life coach. I didn't even know what a life coach was. I didn't know what CBT was. I didn't know what NLP was. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the other methods that I, I tend to talk about and use in my sessions. Um, I feel more than anything like this was a bit of a calling. This was kind of, I realized that the, uh, the accumulative experiences that led me towards self-sabotage early in my life and all those programs that were running in my head were very much lessons that I could either uh, learn from, take something from and move forward, or they were going to destroy me. It was going to be one or the other. Um, I was either going to end my life, I was either going to drink my way to death or worse, something else, um, or I was going to use those experiences, recognize that it was some kind of a leading towards some kind of a spiritual awakening of some sort, and I could contribute to other people's lives in a positive way. Thankfully, uh, I took the route of recognizing how important this work is. And the fact that this work isn't necessarily getting the type of um, solutions that many anxiety sufferers out there are, in fact, looking for. Um, I made a firm decision that if I could get myself out of such a deep rut, a deep funk, I believe that uh, other people could also do the same. And, uh, and I really started to um, shift things in my mind, shift things in my body, shift things in a spiritual manner. And, uh, and I started to delete some of those self-punishing programs that were installed into my subconscious. And I started to replace those with other things. But, uh, but yeah, man, it was, really, it was really more of a calling more than anything. And if somebody said I'd be seeing three, four people each and every day, having a digital program and doing the podcast thing and the YouTube thing, you know, seven, eight years ago, I would have said, no, I'd probably stay (laughs) as a tennis coach and kind of, you know, uh, do that for the rest of my life and, and stay in the rat race in North America. But, um, but it's been a, a really interesting journey and I'm really happy to be on it, man. And it was that pressure, I guess, of being the best in tennis, that pressure from your family and trying to live up to some sort of potential, like a high high bar. 
Absolutely. The, Absolutely. Never fully I mean, being a kid. Mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have a childhood. First of all, mm-hmm. um, I would be the first person out of school. Um, and the, the person that was on the tennis court and while everybody else was playing on the playground, doing the soccer thing as a, as a recreational kind of running around thing, playing tag, hide and go see bigger part of me wanted to find out what it was like to be like the others. Um, so I was really torn between, do I enjoy this sport in my heart? Um, you know, later on, once my conscious mind developed around 12, 13, 14, um, and then, uh, you know, what was I missing out on? So I feel like, you know, when I look back now, I can either say that I wasted a lot of time um, on a sport that I really didn't want to follow through with in my heart. Uh, it was more of a goal, a desire set from from my parents, mainly my dad. Uh, I could either look at it and regret the time I lost and blame and have guilt and such, or I could look at those experiences and say that the accumulation of all those things led me to this place where I am right now. And I choose to take the second road because um, I believe that there are multiple quantum possibilities as far as how you can perceive things that happen in your life. But you have to really, in your heart, be open to those possibilities if you want to, in fact, perceive things that happen to you differently uh, and therefore move forward towards, you know, um, different experiences in your life and actually becoming the type of person you want to become. Right. Definitely. And for those listening who are currently facing severe anxiety, what are some of the techniques or new habits they can begin like starting now to help better that current state of mind and that are are completely sensitized right now. And like myself, I used to have no idea what was going on. I never studied neuro neuroscience. I never Mm. went to university and studied all this stuff. We're never, we're never brought into this world with an instruction manual. So what are the, habits and some techniques that you can, what they can begin right now to help Mm -hmm. better themselves? Um, Yes. You know, when, uh, when I'm discussing this sort of thing, it's important to get an understanding of why someone has this anxiety in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I can't even say the majority of people, I can say pretty much everybody that I've worked with has gone through this cycle where um, through conception until the ages of five, where, um, you know, if you think about a sponge, when is the sponge most absorbent? When it's dry. So Hmm. during conception to five years old, the child is sponge-like, open, ready for suggestion. Anything that comes in becomes their programs, becomes their belief system, becomes their identity. Around five years old, there is, you know, there's this development of what's called your critical faculty, which is, in fact, um, the security guard that wants to maintain those original programs. So what I've seen with anxiety sufferers over and over again, and this is something that is uh, is going to be very new to a lot of people, because what you see in most anxiety treatments is the surface level stuff. But when we backtrack a little bit, we recognize that conception of five programs, and those were very much self-punishing, self-limiting programs. Now, as a person goes about their lives, the subconscious mind, as a goal-achieving agency, is trying to fulfill the need of those programs. It doesn't know the difference between what's good and bad. It just knows that it needs to fulfill the needs of those original programs. So here's somebody at the age of 35. And they've lived through these programs, these self-sabotaging, self-punishing, self-mutilizing programs up to the age of 35. And all of a sudden they say, hey, I want to change my life. And the subconscious is going, (laughs) it's not going to be that easy. Mm -hmm. Um, Because you're dealing with 
a monster here. You're dealing with a, a system within you that has held on to those original experiences, those emotional traumas, you know, the belief systems of the past. It's holding on to them for dear life. And then there's a critical faculty, the security guard, that makes sure that anything that is new doesn't enter the subconscious mind. So now you're up against it, right? right. So my biggest problem in today's uh, anxiety recovery world is surface, surface level stuff, where somebody, you know, anxiety sufferers will go the motivation route, or they'll go the willpower route, or they'll... They'll try to change their thinking consciously, but not do any, any kind of subconscious or altered state work. And what happens? Tons of frustration, tons of bewilderment. Why is this not working for me? And they go, oh, I feel a little bit better. Oh, the sensations are back. And they keep falling for the old programs, right? Right. So as far as, uh, sorry, long-winded answer to your question, but... No. Um, as far as techniques and such go, I'm a humongous believer, and the more research I do, the more I talk to, you know, coaches, professionals like yourself, I am a big believer that emotional reframing is an absolute necessary component to anxiety recovery, uh, emotional distress, any of that stuff. And, and that, what, what you just said there... I, I notice that whenever I do emotional reframing, every time I go back to the experience, even though it could be the fiftieth time, say going back to it, just to just to fully cement the new beliefs, so to speak, I always notice in the environment something new, something I haven't noticed since I was that age. You Brilliant! Notice, you notice different things, like oh, I I, can't, I I forgot I even had that toy in that corner, like I didn't even know. I, it's amazing. What you can tap into. Absolutely. I mean, as far as specific techniques, you know, emotional reframing comes with many different angles. I mean, um, you emotional reframing can you can go the NLP route, which in, in neuro linguistic programming, what the founder Richard Bandler would say is to alter certain images that you have in your mind that continue to play out, that continue to basically ruin your life. So what he would do, you know, and what I tend to do if I feel like the moment's right, is I would say, you know, um, give you a kind of a countdown from five to one or whatever it is. First and foremost, you want to make sure that you relax the mind and the body together. Because if you don't get to a relaxed state yourself, the critical faculty is still highly engaged and is still protecting those original programs. So relaxation is absolutely key. This sort of altered state work where you make peace with peace, I call it. Mm -hmm. you got to make peace with peace. But you notice a lot of anxiety sufferers are hanging on for dear life. You tell them five to one and you're going to relax and we're going to go to the original scene that has everything to do with what you're feeling today. And they go, you know, they're, they're holding on to dear life. They're trying, but they're scared to let go. Right there right. It tells you that, you know, they're not comfortable with the flow of life. Um, and, and worry has equaled safety for them. If I worry, I'm safe. Um, if I worry, it's familiar to me. So these people need to have a deep understanding of, you know, that world of unknown is a lot more dangerous in your mind than the actual reality of the situation. So there has to be a kind of an acceptance of the fact that, hey, you know, I trust Brad, you know, I trust Dennis for this, and I'm going to let myself go as best I can in this current situation. Great. So technique-wise, emotional reframing, um, NLP, I would highly suggest people at least look into it and um, familiarize themselves with that particular method. As well, um, there is things such as holographic memory resolution through a one of my mentors, Brent Baum. He does a fantastic job where um, he goes to the original event and he gets you playing it out and you're feeling the symptoms. And then he would ask you, well, what do you wish would have happened instead on that day? Go back, imagine it, you know, go ahead and see, hear and feel exactly what you wish would have happened instead. And then there you are in that moment, you know, you're, you're perceiving things differently. You're conversing with people differently. And by the end of it, you're going, okay, well, yeah, okay, I'm done. 
I opened up my eyes, Dennis. Um, that really didn't happen. Well, then I would ask you, I would say, well, if you were to look back at that past experience, how would you perceive it right now? There's all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff that comes out, right? So um, that method isn't necessarily to, you know, to rearrange what how to end that process, to look back and to perceive it differently. And when you change the meaning over an event, you change your emotional, you know, build up to it, your emotional charge behind it. Which is the key, right? right? And a lot of a lot of people who have anxiety, the amygdala is that fight, freeze, and flight response that is causing bodily sensations. And one of the biggest things that I experienced was having that pains and having the uncomfortable feelings. And what you just said there, the release of the the traumatic event, I noticed the pain would lift. Right. And, and, Absolutely. And so what you're saying is some events are associated with certain pains that can happen in your body and even diseases. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. I mean, I'm a firm believer that the emotional state of a person is the very thing that dictates whether or not someone gets a disease or not. You know, if you, if you shake a, a Coke bottle enough, eventually it's going to explode, right? And it's either going to be explode or it's going to be implode. One of those two are going to happen. So I, and I've seen cases of this over and over again, especially in my own family, where I have people live till 94, 95. You know, I have, uh, I had a grandfather live till 98 and I'm asking myself, well, what the heck do they do differently? They didn't eat differently, <laughs> but he was very expressive, really expressive. And so are, you know, my grandmas and stuff expressive. They don't hold things in. They don't over concern themselves over things that are outside of their control. I mean, these are just, these are habits that can in fact be built up, but you have to be open to the idea of becoming someone new because right. until the old you pretty much dies and passes away, you cannot become someone new. And that scares the crap out of people. Right. And I, I, I truly up to um, I experienced an anxiety disorder probably roughly two two years ago. It was the end of it, and and a lot of like early twenties, I experienced a lot of deep shame, and I was ashamed of who I was at my core, and that really affected uh, me because I, I had a lot of guilt. I, I, then I became closed off, and then I I started to have panic around people in certain situations and then I wouldn't tell anybody and then, and then people would wonder why I'm so quiet. So I mm -hmm. that's exactly what you're saying. Like mm -hmm. we don't know how to open up and we grow with certain patterns and mm -hmm. blockages Absolutely. that, uh, you know, we don't know how to express ourselves, which is, uh, yeah. it's, it's a shame really. And, and even technology I think is becoming worse when it comes to being closed off. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, I'll give you an example so the listeners get a better idea of this, Brad. Um, and don't get me wrong. I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of CBT. In fact, my program is based around CBT, which is, you know, the cognitive and the behavioral side of things. As you're going through the day, you're countering old thinking patterns. Mm -hmm. You're countering behaviors and such. That's very important as you go through the day. But again, the critical faculty is involved as you're going through the day. Right? You're not in that relaxed state to get it out of the way, to converse directly with the, the original programs. Um, there's uh, my second mentor, Stephen Parkhill, who, uh, uh, great book, Answer Cancer. And, you know, uh, and, you know, he's talking about physical ailments and such, but this relates to anxiety disorders and, and emotional distress very much so. He talks about a, uh, a backwards triangle, for example, like a backwards triangle. Uh, at the top of that triangle are the symptoms, okay, the, the effects of everything. In the middle of that triangle is the subsequent traumatic events, the subsequent events that happen to someone. And at the bottom of it is the initial sensitizing event. Now, what he mentions, and I believe this wholeheartedly, is that in today's world, what do most talk counselors, um, psychotherapists, and I'm not, you know, there's a time and place for them. But what, where are we moving ourselves towards when we're talking about treatment today? We're talking about the top 
of that backwards triangle, which are the symptoms. So we have a symptom, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to release ourselves of the symptom without releasing ourselves or re-perceiving what's at the bottom of that backwards triangle, which is the initial sensitizing event. Mm -hmm. If I re-perceive what happened to me when I was, you know, between conception and five, which is done through altered state work, um, if I can get there, if I can release the emotional charge, forgive, get rid of the guilt, get rid of the blame, all that stuff, then what happens is everything above starts to disappear. Right. Hmm. But in today's world, if you're trying to logically talk yourself out of anxiety, and I tried that. I spent lots of money talking about my, my, my stuff, um, and I got nowhere, right? So, which tells you that, you know, a symptom went away as far as health anxiety goes. But what happened? What happens to everybody? Another symptom shows up or it shows up in a different part of your body or something like that. Right. Which tells you that the initial sensitizing event, the original programs, are still running. And that's the case for pretty much every anxiety sufferer that I've worked with in the last number of years. So that's just a good example of what's going on in today's world. We cannot continue to um, waste our time trying to get rid of symptoms. We have to talk about causes. And to be able to face the very thing that you're running from, to face the very thing that you're trying to numb aside, um, and to do the work. To do the work, to get the skills, and to move forward, right? And um, that's the key, man. And, and facing uh, your symptoms and panic, what are some ways people can start facing their panic starting today? Their panic facing attacks. Panic attacks specifically? Yeah. Um, I, per I personally would work on preventing a panic attack rather than waiting for the, the attack to happen and then doing something. Yeah. Um, because once the once you know once those two parts of your brain are working in tag team, your survival and your emotional brain, you're not going to think yourself out of a panic attack. I don't care what you say. Um, so I would work on prevention. I would say, you know what? I've had this panic attack, uh, you know, in my workplace a couple days ago. I'm still holding on to the same memory of it and such. If it were to occur and I were to get sensitized like that, what would I do differently this time? Um, more than anything, you know, when I'm talking about a panic attack, if you haven't had a panic attack, it's, it's, it's the worst thing you could ever feel. It's the closest thing to death that you can go through. In my opinion, it's bewildering. Um, you want to feel better right in that moment as quickly as you can. <clears throat> so more than anything for me, for panic attacks, it's about prevention. I, in my heart, believe that if a person's sympathetic system, sympathetic nervous system is constantly on their fight or flight system, it's inevitable that an attack is going to happen, right, at some point in the day. Right. But if a person begins to work and activate their parasympathetic system, then there is some, there's an opening, there's a gap there to begin to perceive things differently, right? If I can get my rest and digest system involved and activated. Now that opens up the door for me to be able to see that person differently, my workplace differently, waking up in the morning, morning anxiety in the past differently, evening this differently. So uh, prevention, most important, rather than if I get a panic attack, what's going Because if you're saying, if I get a panic attack, you're going to have a panic attack. Um, in that moment, there is nothing logical that you can really do in order to stop the panic attack. Um, mm. But I would, in my heart, if it was in the moment of panicking, I would begin doing the opposite of what my body tells me to do, of course. which would be things like, okay, speed up, speed up. I would do my best to slow down. Um, Things even, you know, your breathing is very, very shallow and you notice a lot of people trying to take deep breaths and not working. I, in that moment, as far as breathing would go, would focus on a two by two kind of rhythm, two seconds in, two seconds out, and allow my system to balance it out naturally instead of forcing it. Um, so those are two main things I would do. And even not running away 
Because you're just going to strengthen that amygdala, that, that pathway, well said. right? Well said. Well said. So you run, you create that same associate. Exactly. The association mm-hmm. gets stronger. And and the more the more you get the more you face panic, the more you you strengthen the pathway that um, you know you teach the amygdala that it isn't fearful, and also cognitive diffusion, letting it flow through you and and not not face not trying to control each thought and trying to analyze each thought but actually just like giving in and just letting go is something i kind of got better at as the the months went on just like ah, I'm, like I, I don't care if it kills me mm-hmm. you know interesting and and i th- i think like the fear of death is one of the common fears when someone is suffering from anxiety Mm-hmm. How can we kind of look at death differently when mm-hmm. when you're when you're trying to coach somebody who is suffering severely from anxiety? How can you sort of um, uh, integrate death as a teacher rather than something to fear? So, if you think about the fear of dying, you'll mm-hmm. you'll also notice a very common pattern is the fear of living. So people don't necessarily allow themselves to live fully because mm-hmm. they're so scared of you know, the inevitable. So because this is the case, um, what we again have to do is we have to go back to the original event that we believe has caused this fear or disalignment or this lack of flow in life. When did it happen? You'll notice people talk about, well, you know, my uncle passed away here or, you know, I saw this or I read that or I watched this documentary or whatever. And that's the possibly the Uh, initial sensitizing event that has caused that sensitivity. So again, it's all about re-perceiving and changing the meaning over what happened then. But it's also being able to create a ton of pain around living the same way that you're currently living. So if I associate a ton of pain to holding on to these same belief systems, when we die, it's all over. Uh, If I die, you know, I'm going to hell. If I hold on to these same beliefs, it's really not encouraging me to learn, to be open to new ideas, to be able to contribute to the world in a positive manner. There is a lot of pain between me and these core belief systems that I continue to act on. So then what's the opposite of it? It's the pleasure side. So the question would be, What perspective do I need to adopt right now? If I put everything aside, my parents' perspectives, you know, my authority figures, my coaches, my teachers, my siblings, if I put all of their perspectives aside as far as, you know, the dying issue, in my heart, what do I need to believe? How do I need to perceive it in order for me to feel neutral to pleasant? That's the question. The million-dollar question. And someone will say, you know what, I heard something a while back, and although I feel really uncomfortable with the idea, I believe in the fact that, you know, we become reincarnated, where our physical body perishes, but, you know, we we take another form of consciousness and and we reappear in some, some other way. Perfect. The question is, is how does that make you feel about dying? You know, I start to, you know, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. Great. Now you won't be so distracted and you can go about your life and do what you're meant to do and learn what you're meant to learn. Perfect. So instead of spending all this time, hours and hours each and every day, you know, over this idea, thinking that the worrying and such is in fact helping you in some way, um, you got to realize how much time you're wasting on all that stuff and have the courage to go against the original programs installed into you. Um, I would put religion in that same place. You know, if you were brought up in a in a specific religious sense, you have to have the courage to be able to look at it and say, this doesn't align with who I want to become and start moving forward somewhere else. Fascinating. It, yeah. What are the patterns you currently run now that you turned 180? from your anxiety you were somebody completely different like you like you just said it's becoming somebody 
just creating a new identity. You're met with incredible resistance. It's absolutely like climbing Mount Everest, like you've said before in many of your podcasts. What patterns do you currently run at the moment that keep you consciously um, aware of yourself and, and aware of the negative energies or the negative thoughts that pop in? Mm. You know what's really interesting on this journey? When you go from a place of where the majority of the world is, what we call unconsciousness, where you're just basically reacting based on what you feel or what someone told you and such, and you're living your life that way. And you go from unconsciousness to a bit of an awakening of some sort, like, holy crap, you know, what I've been believing is actually completely mm-hmm. opposite to, to what I want to believe. And then you go to a place of consciousness, and therefore you go to a place of higher consciousness. When I'm going through my day, I no longer have thoughts. I, I, I can literally say that I, I, I can, I'm not in my head as I go through the day. I go through the day, and I've conditioned myself and trained myself to perceive everything as either a success or a learning opportunity. That's it. Because life is going to throw you all sorts of different challenges. I mean, I get comments all the time like, Dennis, you know, your, your method didn't work for me. And, you know, you're, you're just trying to scam people. And you're this and you're that. And Dennis, this, that. I get all sorts of stuff. My reaction to all those people is I hope you find peace because I'm not the one that you should be concerned over. Your reaction to me is based on your own brain's filter system. You know, you're looking for the bad in everything. You're, you're, you, you know, you're, you're sorting for lack. You're sorting for difficulty. You're sorting for challenges. You're sorting for pain. So you get pain. And so when I go through my day now, I, I basically go by my intuition. I feel something and it feels right. Or I feel something and it feels wrong and therefore it's a learning opportunity. And I follow that, and it's done, it's helped me move forward to such levels in life where, you know, in the last couple of years, my my, my whole life changed. I can't tell you, you know, what a difference this awakening to becoming more conscious has taken me. So as far as habits for me, um, I meditate twice a day, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. I do that twice a day, Um, as well as I'm going through the day, I will make sure that I ask myself one particular question, and that question is, what's fun about this? Uh, And I have conditioned myself already to say, you know, in this moment, what's fun about this? It's fun that I get to make a new friend, Brad, right? It's fun to be able to contribute to people in a positive manner, Um, because the only time that I am really thinking and in my head is when I consciously take myself somewhere new, such as this idea. What's fun about this? Or what else could this mean? Right? Those sort of questions are very open-ended questions. They're very powerful questions. So I've been able to find you know, good in pretty much everything, you know, even, even death, even dying. People have died around me. And, you know, I was originally told that I need to grieve, which I naturally do in my own way. But then I start to go, well, you know, grandpa passed and such. And what did he leave me? What sort of lessons did he leave me with? What am I grateful for when he was around? You know, what has what else? And I start to just ponder all those things and I celebrate his life. And I start to say, what would my life have been like if he weren't in my life for all those years? total flip right no kidding but it's such a it's such a a different idea to people because you know we are the media our authority figures who did their best um advertising the the whole idea in today's world where you got to shoot for your dreams and you got to go for it always keeps a person in a world of feeling like they're empty you know Shoot for your dreams, shoot for your dreams, motivation, motivation. Um, There is a sense of emptiness all the time when someone follows those messages consistently. I have a problem with that, personally. 
Um, I'm a big believer in goals. And as you're shooting for those goals, there should be no reason for you to feel absolutely solid in who you currently are and the lessons that you've learned and where you're going in your life. Even though like everyone has different traumatic events and life experiences, what are the common threads between all of these people that you coach? Like, and I'm talking about like the needs people need to meet that are just mm. keeping them in their state in a, in such a bad state. Yeah. I would say, uh, certainty is one. Mm -hmm. So the worrying, the over concerning, the keeping with the status quo, uh, keeping with the same, self-sabotaging, self-punishing programs, as much as it's painful, it is safe. It is certain. I am certain to feel crappy tomorrow morning, just like I felt crappy today. And therefore, mm -hmm. if I change, and if I, I, if I truly adopt a new way of living, I don't know what to expect there. It's a totally different world. So the idea of living a life or adopting belief systems that make a person feel uncertain scares the living crap out of them, right? So first would be certainty. Next would be significance. I noticed that a ton, if not every single, I could, I could literally say that, every single anxiety sufferer who's come to me for help has gone through a deep sense of loneliness during their childhood, a lack of love, a lack of acceptance, a lack of understanding. When someone has anxiety in today's world, and I've asked them this question, I, I'm, I was really curious about it. Does it, in fact, give you a sense of significance and a sense of a full-on identity? You know, you didn't, you wanted to be someone during your child years, in the school years. You wanted to portray yourself as someone, but your peers saw you as someone else. Therefore, you took on that identity instead. Right. Right. So here I am trying to be this happy, peaceful, you know, open person, loving at school. But, you know, the other kids are telling me that I can't be that person. I'm, I got made fun of. I got bullied. I got this. I got that. And therefore, you go to what those people will ex accept from you and that kind of identity. And I do everything I can to look cool and be cool. And I start the smoking thing. And I, you know, take on certain wardrobes that I'd never wear in my life just so I could be accepted, just so I can feel a sense of significance and companionship and be a part of a tribe. So I would say certainty is a very common one with anxiety, the need for that. Um, number two is a sense of significance. Anxiety, a lot of people don't want to admit it, but it does give them a sense of significance as well, the love and connection that they receive from their supporters, wife, husband, friends, whatever. Oh, here comes the, uh, the anxious lady, right? Oh, she's yeah. going to fill us with another story. You know, we'll give her some tender love and care. We'll tell her that everything's going to be all right. You know, that sort of thing. And I'll feel accepted. I'll feel like I am being heard, which never happened when I was a kid. Right. And, and therefore, unconsciously, I keep myself in this anxious state, but they won't admit it. Right. I used to hold on to that. And I used to want to fit in consciously. I was dyeing my hair different colors. I remember constantly went, going out and picking out certain clothing to wear, oh, yeah. especially, especially going through college or like that, that whole phase and oh, yeah. you know, trying out I marijuana. I went through the Chris Cross phase. Oh, God, remember Chris man. Cross? No. <laughs> <laughs> I used to wear my clothes backwards so that oh kids would God. accept me. Yeah. I, I never heard about that. Two, two, two rappers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did everything we could. <laughs> oh yeah. And that's that's a that's a huge thing and I think one of the biggest impacts today is YouTube and social media. And it, it, it I can't I don't know where to begin with these music videos, these sexually explicit content, the 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 promotion of drugs. It's a very touchy subject and it it and it's so but the thing is is that it's very open. Like anybody can go on YouTube and look at and look at it, and that's I think that's not only an ad addiction to just keep watching YouTube videos, but to imitate these people that are 
promoting this stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's good that you touched on this in this episode. It's really important. I mean, we're constantly being programmed subliminally, subconsciously, and consciously. And I'll tell you something, the subliminally is the most powerful in my opinion. Um, subliminally, what's going on right now in the world is that um, there are certain messages that we're constantly hearing. For example, if you listen to a music video um, these days, how many times do you hear the chorus? You hear it probably up to, if not more, about 80 times within a four-minute period. So what's the message in that chorus? Right. It's not good. Yeah. Right. It's not benefiting you in any way. And guess what? We know now, based on ancient wisdom, how effective suggestion is. So if I repeat something in my mind 80 times, what do you think is going to happen? Of I'm going to begin thinking in that way. I'm going to see myself in that way. I'm going to see the world in a fearful way. I'm going to begin, you know, Moving towards the world of consumption because I feel so empty inside. I need something to fill that void. I got to buy that. I got to drink that. I got to take that drug. I got to do whatever it takes to fill that spot. And think about the idea that if you listen to five songs, my math is not good, eight times five, 40, <laughs> 4, 400, 400 <laughs> auto suggestions within a very short period of time God. that's a lot that's a lot of auto suggestions right um and we're not even talking about the rest of the song right oh it's like, just a song it's just lyrics oh it feels <laughs> good when i hear it trust me you know there is some inner workings going on here that you are not aware of I went through the Nirvana phase where I kind of looked at Kurt Cobain as like, which um, by all means, he's an amazing guitar player. He's very talented and everything. But the the lyrics, you know, I think I'm dumb. I think I'm dumb in that song, dumb. And like it, it, going back and revisiting like these, these songs and emanating somebody who really had a severe mental illness, even though he was completely talented in all ways, lyrically and and uh, such a guitar player, there is something there that it's not good to, to, you know, like take on that heavy of a song constantly or like music constantly or looking up to somebody who is not well mentally, you know, and sending a wrong message and not knowing. Yeah. So that was a big one. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, I don't know. I don't know about you, but I was pretty empty in my high school years. You know, I I was I was listening to all sorts of stuff, and uh, you know, I programmed myself to um, to realize that hey, you know what, I I uh, I don't deserve self love. In fact, the love has to be from something on the outside. Um, there's a void within me. I feel empty. I feel unloved. I feel disconnected. Um, and, and that's it. I mean, that's consumerism today. It's, 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 it's going, it's, it is in that direction. We're as a society feeling more and more empty. We as a society are accumulating those original self punishing programs within us. They're getting stronger and stronger. And the longer those programs stay active, the more challenging they become to reverse. Um, but, uh, it is reversible. Right. And that's, it's that, that's something people need to understand, that our brains are very neuroplastic, which means we can exactly. change it. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, like, it, and like the parents and, and I think uh, anybody influential, parents, um, friends, they, they implement sayings like, oh, you know, you can't teach a dog new tricks or mm -hmm. I'm, too, I'm too tired for that. I'm too old for mm -hmm. that. All these <laughs> things have such mm -hmm. a big impact, right? Absolutely. So. I mean, if you if you look at my my dad, he's seventy. Uh, a year ago, he kind of relapsed, went back into anxiety, started a bit of a a program that I gave him. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, his life has been changed for the better. He's keeping it up. Um. So the idea and those you know those quotes that of uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks and stuff like that is just you know. It sounds 
interesting. It sounds like something everybody else would say, and therefore we all take it on. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we have to begin questioning those things based on sound facts and actual evidence that um, that people that are not so much in the mainstream, but um, underneath the coaches, you know, the practitioners, the people that are working hard uh, that are not in the mainstream, um, the results that they're getting because they don't we don't hear about that stuff so much. You think about Stephen Parkhill, who who was healing stage four cancers consistently. There's something here. I mean, there's mm-hmm. something there. I, I never heard about it till a few years ago, mm-hmm. right? In school, I was never taught this stuff. Parents never knew about it. Why? Right? It's just absolutely mind blowing to me. And I watched the Brent Baum's uh, lecture on YouTube about holographic memory resolution. And he went on and said, you know, he treated over 70,000 people and he treated so many cancer patients and people with diseases and released the energy and they've gotten better. And it's totally. abs- like, I- which, which shows you the emotional connection to physical ailments. Right. right. It's that whole, I mean, he mentions and he, he says, he puts it really well. He says that a, uh, an emotionally traumatic experience can be lodged anywhere in the nervous system, phys- in your physical body and your, in your energetic body. So it gets mm-hmm. stored. And then someone says, I've got this lump in the throat. They never stop to consider the initial sensitizing event that just got there and then accumulated over time. And again, you change the meaning over the event. Watch what happens to the symptom. Right. right. Yeah. It d- dissipates. It dissipates. And... Somebody going through anxiety recovery, they've decided they, 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 they got a paradigm shift. They, they realize, wait, the, the way I'm living is not correct. It's not really who I am. I'm just, I'm just a slave to all of my feelings and thoughts, and I'm getting pulled in so many um, addictive behaviors. Um, how, and, and somebody starting recovery, how do they know that you know, they're on the right track and that it's working? Mm. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, we have to be real with this whole recovery idea. And a lot of people mm-hmm. aren't. Right. You know, after years and decades and decades of, of running self-punishing programs within your subconscious, someone will go and try meditation. I've seen it over and over again. It didn't work for me. Okay. Um, or something else. didn't work for me. The expectation, there has to be no expectation in order for you to gain everything. So this has to be seen, even though I myself have seen and have gone through people that have recovered, you know, quite quickly. But the whole mindset before we get going has to be, at least in my opinion, uh, a whole identity transformation has to take a minimum of three months. Along those three months, it's got to be treated like a 24-hour job. That doesn't mean you're obsessive over it. It just means that you're self-aware. So, you know that you're on the right track when you begin to tip the scales between things that used to cause you a lot of grief and a lot of sensitization and a lot of negative emotions, and you leave that place and you get to a more neutral place. Uh, When I can look at something that, or an environment, or a certain person, or a situation, when I can look at that situation... And I can say, you know what, I feel pretty neutral about this situation that I'm about to go into. That's when you know that what you're doing is actually working. People always say, I'm not good in crowds. Okay, well, to that I ask, what are you going to gain by going into that crowd? You're not good in crowds because of, yes, the original experience, but you're focusing on the wrong parts of the crowd. You're focusing on how bright the lights are going to be. You're focusing on the past panic attack. You're focusing on making a fool out of yourself. I mean, anybody that focuses on this sort of stuff is not going to be really well off when they enter that situation, are they? So instead, you know, I get the opportunity to heal my body at a deeper level by connecting with more people. I get to make a friend. I get to learn something from someone. I get to challenge myself in 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 a new way. Great. Now you're taking control of your focus, which means that it's also affecting your emotional state 
and your long-term memory is also getting tweaked. Your subconscious is down there going, hey, do you want to keep the same meaning over the, over the same experience? That's where symptoms come in. If I feel a symptom before I go into a situation, it's just the subconscious asking a question. Do you want to hold on to the same meaning or not? I start to breathe heavily. I start to, you know, try to get out of the situation as quick as I can. The same association is there. But if I start to slow down, if I change my focus, now I'm answering the subconscious and saying this environment, this situation is safe. Boom. One tick towards a history of success. When you gather enough history of success, the perception at a heart level begins to change. Not just at a thinking level, and I hope it happens, at a real heart level. I'm okay where I am. So I would say that that is the biggest indicator that you're moving in the right direction. And when you're in that situation, I remember I, I, I went to a lot of events when I was going through anxiety recovery. I was going to symphonies, operas, and concerts. And I would all, all of a sudden get a wave of panic when I was in that area. And it's all, it's, it almost hits you so suddenly. And and I, I noticed that when each time that I got the sick feeling in my stomach, the dizziness, the lightheadedness, I always just stayed with it. And each time I went and redid the event or concert, it got less and less and less until eventually I didn't even notice. So I think right. that's one thing people need to understand is that you never Excellent. avoid the situation. Right. Which is, and you probably took your time to go back to that same environment quite quickly, mm-hmm. redo the whole thing, and then leave it? Okay. That's yeah, good stuff. Definitely. Yeah. Excellent. How important is it to adopt new role models in your life and, and try and mirror, mirror uh, new people and get rid of old friends or get rid of uh, old role models? Totally. I mean, when we're talking about NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, for example, it's based around modeling. So it's based around the types of thinking that has got these people to a place where they are successful, happy, fulfilled, whatever it is. So um, I, in I, talking from personal experience, I think that having a one to three role models where you study them extensively and begin to understand them at a deep level, not just at a surface level where you see their behaviors and their actions and stuff like that, but you start to question, you know, how would they think in this situation? How would they think in that situation? Um, When you can get to that place, you begin to say, okay, I'd like to adopt this about my, that, my, that role model. I'd like to adopt this about this role model. And more than anything, The mindset as far as modeling goes is that within a three-month period, you have a a movie role. And that movie role is going to begin, and you're the leading actor. You've got three three months to prepare for that movie. Perfect. Now I don't have any pressure on me. I can go ahead and study these people. I can go ahead and act the part. And it's not so much fake it till you make it. It's basically practice it until you become it. So it's a totally different approach to that old saying. But to answer the question, I can't tell you how important modeling is. I can't tell you how important it is to have a role model, an influencer that you look up to and to study and to work on becoming. And don't be scared of totally becoming them because you're going to find your own flavor, your own identity. You're going to mold yourself. And you're going to begin taking on those specific traits of those other people. So to answer that question, it is absolutely vital. And Mm -hmm. I'm really, you know, I don't know how people function in today's world without a role model, without an influencer. Um, I don't know how they do it. I really don't. And um, getting to the end of the interview, Dennis, I want to bring up one more topic. It's, um, what I found what I found difficult when I was recovering from anxiety, it, I became so focused, hypervigilant on my uh, internal world and getting better. 
And I was so, I got really serious when I was recovering and I lost touch of my playful side and that kind of, I became more serious because I, I, I took getting better seriously. Um, mm -hmm. how, how are ways that we can start adopting more of a playful side and sort of let go and, and let loose a bit? Yeah, I mean, you, you got to basically, and again, be, being this playful means using your imagination in a good way rather than a harmful way. So again, it's it's absolutely crucial that people take on a playful side to them. But again, to be able to take on that playful side, it has to be aligned with your new identity. Right. If you are this person who craves certainty everywhere they look, someone who doesn't necessarily believe in a sense of humor because it's useless or this or that, mm. um, then you know what? All the playfulness is just going to basically be false and you're not going to adopt it in the long term. You're not going to gain the benefits from it. So you have to look at your identity as a whole and say, you know what, in this identity that I want to become, and I have been that person, I just want to be a better version of that person. There is sense of humor. There is fun. There is lightheartedness. You have to begin to study the person that you want to become before you become that person. So right. I would say get to know the new identity real in real depth before you jump into action. Like really get to know where you're going, who you're becoming, how you want to think, how you want to act, um, how you want to use your imagination for the better. And then you're giving your subconscious a clear vision as to who you want to become and possibly how quick you want to become that person. Right? But to answer the question... Playfulness is absolutely vital because playfulness and humor, in fact, gets the critical faculty out of the way. And you get to directly communicate with the subconscious again. When you find the fun in things and when your life becomes of love, all of a sudden those old programs, or at least your perceptions over the past events, begin to shift. Your life mm -hmm. changes. Everything becomes lighter. You start to see things as they are, not worse than they are. Absolute key. Dennis, let's end on that note. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for for joining me on my podcast. It's we've touched on so many subjects. I can't even believe it. <laughs> um, we added so much information and value to our listeners, and I just wanted to thank you so much and what you do and everything that you do. And go check out Dennis on anxietyexit.com check out the program and the anxiety program and make sure you subscribe to his the anxiety guy podcast on itunes thank you dennis much love my friend thanks for having me thank you thanks for being an important part of the anxiety guy podcast community if you enjoyed this podcast please leave a positive rate and review if you're searching for further support on your road to recovery from anxiety, head over to anxietyexit.com and take part in the powerful End the Anxiety program based around the CBT model. If you're searching for a more one-on-one -on -one approach, you can sign up now for personal coaching sessions with Dennis via Skype. Remember, you are more than anxiety. See you in the next episode.